Welcome to Come Follow Me, Canadian Style. We're in the Book of Mormon. Today we're covering Mosiah 7 through 10. This is week 19. I'm going to show you a few graphics here just to kind of help you through this complex time that we're in. We're going to do some flashbacks. Mormon has compiled his book here to allow us to learn different things for specific reasons, which we'll talk about later. So, just as an overview, you'll remember that the Jaredites, who came over at the time of the Tower of Babel, occupied the land northward. The land southward was occupied by the Mulekites and Lehi and his family. Lehi's family subsequently split into the Lamanites and to the Nephites. The Nephites moved away in order to avoid bloodshed. The Mulekites ended up on the east side of this landmass. And the Lamanites and Nephites landed on the west side and then, of course, migrated apart. We've recently had discussions about King Messiah and how he was forced to leave the land of Nephi and head north to join up with the Mulekites, and they became a united nation surrounding the area known as Zarahemla. Then we'll get into the story of Zenith who left the Nephites in the area around Zarahemla and traveled back to the land of Nephi. Now that's confusing, I know, because the land of Nephi is occupied by Lamanites. And he did this because he had an affinity to the Lamanites and wanted to reestablish or reconnect himself in the original area around Nephi. Then we get into the area of King Benjamin, who is ruling the Nephites, and the Mulekites up at and around Zarahemla. And we introduce into the story Zenith, Noah, Abinadi, and Limhi. We'll talk about those subsequently. By the time of King Mosiah II, this is when Limhi actually travels to occupy the land of Nephi and to make a treaty with the Lamanites. Be very careful as you go through these different flashbacks to pay attention to the time frames that are listed in each of the chapters. Okay, chapter 7, which is our reading today, and you can see this is about 121 BC. Verse 1, And now it came to pass that after King Mosiah had had continual peace for the space of three years, he was desirous to know concerning the people who went up to dwell in the land of Lehi-Nephi. This is also known as the land of Nephi, or in the city of Lehi-Nephi, for his people had heard nothing from them from the time they left the land of Zarahemla. Therefore they worried him with their teasings. And it came to pass that King Mosiah granted that sixteen of their strong men might go up to the land of Lehi-Nephi to inquire concerning their brethren. Now this number sixteen strong men is very interesting. I don't know that it was on purpose, but it's telling that if you look at it today, and if you consider the leader of their party to be a prototype of Jesus Christ, then we have 15 strong men with the Savior who lead the church today. I just thought that was just kind of intriguing. Again, I don't know if it was on purpose, but it's fun to look at. Verse 3, and it came to pass that on the moral they started to go up, having with them Ammon, he being a strong and mighty man, and a descendant of Zarahemla, and he was also their leader. Now they knew not the course they should travel in the wilderness to go up to the land of Lehi-Nephi, Therefore they wandered many days in the wilderness, even 40 days did they wander. In the Hebrew culture, the number 40 means a long time. But regardless if this is actually 40 days or just a long time, we learn later that the travel time between Nephi and Zarahemla is only 21 days or three weeks. And so they really did do a bunch of wandering. They arrive at a hill overlooking the land of Nephi. And then when they approach the gates, they're captured. Verse 6, And Ammon took three of his brethren, and their names were Amalekai, Helam, and Hem. And they went down into the land of Nephi. And behold, they meet the king of the people who were in the land of Nephi, in the land of Shilom. And they are surrounded by the king's guard, and were taken and bound and were committed to prison. Not exactly the welcoming party that they were hoping for. And it came to pass that when they had been in prison for two days, they were again brought before the king, and their bands were loosed, and they stood before the king, and were permitted, or rather commanded, 
they should answer the questions which he should ask them. And he said unto them, Behold, I am Limhi, the son of Noah, who was the son of Zenith, who came out of the land of Zarahemla to inherit this land, which was the land of their fathers, who was made a king by the voice of the people. Verse 11, And now for this cause have I suffered that you should be preserved, that I might inquire of you, or else I would have caused that my guards should have put you to death. You're permitted to speak. And when Ammon saw that he was permitted to speak, he went forth and bowed himself before the king. Rising again, he said, O king, I'm very thankful before God this day that I'm yet alive, and I'm permitted to speak, and I will endeavor to speak with boldness. For I am assured that if you had known me, you would not have suffered that I should have worn these bands. For I am Ammon, and I'm a descendant of Zarahemla, and have come up out of the land of Zarahemla to inquire concerning our brethren, whom Zenith brought out of the land. And now it came to pass that after Limhi had heard the words of Ammon, he was exceedingly glad and said, Now I know of a surety that my brethren who are in the land of Zarahemla are yet alive, and now I will rejoice, and on the morrow I will cause that my people shall rejoice also. Limhi had assumed that Zarahemla had been destroyed. Verse 15, For behold, we are in bondage to the Lamanites, and are taxed with a tax which is grievous to be borne. It was 50%. And now behold, our brethren will deliver us out of bondage, or out of the hands of the Lamanites, and we will be their slaves. For it is better that we would be slaves to the Nephites than to pay tribute to the king of the Lamanites. Verse 18. And it came to pass that when they gathered themselves together, that he spake unto them in this wise, O ye, my people, lift up your heads and be comforted, for behold, the time is at hand, or is not far distant, when ye shall no longer be in subjection to our enemies. Notwithstanding our many struggles, which have been in vain, yet I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. The important note here is that they had lost hope as far as escaping to an area where they would be safe, and they had struggled against this for years, but now they had hope. They weren't done struggling. There still remained an effectual struggle, but they had at least hope that they could escape somewhere. 19. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice and put your trust in God, in that God who was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and also that God who brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and caused that they should walk through the Red Sea on dry ground and fed them with manna that they might not perish in the wilderness. And many more things did he do for them. Now, throughout the scriptures, all of our scriptures, you have continuous reference to the Abrahamic covenant and also the story of the exodus out of Egypt. Both of these things give people hope and understanding of how the Lord deals with his covenant people. Verse 21, and ye are all witnesses this day that Zenith, who was made king over this people, he being overzealous to inherit the land of his fathers, therefore being deceived by the cunning and craftiness of King Laman, who having entered into a treaty with King Zenith, and having yielded up into his hands the possessions of a part of the land, or even the city of Lehi-Nephi and the city of Shilom, and the land round about. Verse 25, For if this people had not fallen into transgression, the Lord would not have suffered that this great evil should come upon them. But behold, they would not hearken unto his words, but there arose contentions among them, even so much that they did shed blood among themselves, and a prophet of the Lord have they slain, yea, a chosen man of God, who told them of their wickedness and abominations, and prophesied of many things which are to come, yea, even the coming of Christ. Verse 31, And again he saith, If my people shall sow filthiness, they shall reap the east wind, which bringeth immediate destruction. This is a very Middle Eastern saying. If you live in Jerusalem, the north wind is cold, the south wind is warm, the west wind brings moisture, and the east wind brings the hot, dry, miserable, destructive wind from the desert. It doesn't really parallel to the climate where they are now, but it's definitely a Hebrewism. 32, and now behold, the promise of the Lord is fulfilled, and ye are smitten and afflicted. But if you will turn to the Lord, this is also a Hebrewism, from the Hebrew shuv, to turn back, 
literally or figuratively, and we studied this at length in the Old Testament, if you will turn to the Lord with your full purpose of heart and put your trust in him and serve him with all diligence of mind, if you do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. Now, this entire story line that we're into right now talks about bondage. And of course, we're unlikely to ever be in that kind of bondage, but there are so many other kinds of bondage this also relates to. Regardless of the type of bondage, all of the things that we'll talk about and learn from over the next little while are very applicable to today. And I believe that Mormon could see our day and thus edited his book and created it in such a way that it would help us today. On to chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass that after King Limhi had made an end of speaking to his people, for he spake many things unto them, and only a few of them I have written in this book, he told his people all the things concerning their brethren who were in the land of Zarahemla. And he caused that Ammon should stand up before the multitude and rehearse unto them all that had happened unto their brethren from the time that Zenep went up out of the land, even till the time that he himself came up out of the land. And also rehearsed unto them the last words which King Benjamin had taught them and explained them to the people of King Limhi, so that they might understand all the words which he spake. There was an interesting dive that I did this week that explained how the words from King Benjamin had a great influence on all the rest of the Nephite culture and the prophets and the words that they spoke. Verse 5, And it came to pass that he caused the plates which contained the record of his people from the time that they left the land of Zarahemla should be brought before Ammon that he might read them. So even the people that split off from the main group still had metal plates because they knew anything else would not be able to survive. Verse 6, Now as soon as Ammon had read the record, the king inquired of him to know if he could interpret languages, and Ammon told him that he could not. The reason he wants to know is because in their desperation, they sent a party to try to find Zarahemla, and they missed the mark and went past them and ended up in an area that was full of dead people and, and buildings and civilization that had collapsed. So they assumed it was Zarahemla. Verse 7, And the king said unto him, Being grieved for the afflictions of my people, I caused that forty and three of my people should take a journey into the wilderness, that thereby they might find the land of Zarahemla, that we might appeal unto our brethren to deliver us out of bondage. And they were lost in the wilderness for the space of many days. Yet they were diligent and found not the land of Zarahemla, but returned to this land, having traveled in a land among many waters, having discovered a land which was covered with bones of men and of beasts, and was also covered with the ruins of buildings of every kind, having discovered a land which had been peopled with the people who were as numerous as the hosts of Israel. And for a testimony that the things that they had said are true, they have brought 24 plates, which are filled with engravings, and they are of pure gold. This is a artistic rendering of what that might have looked like as they discovered the ruins of the Jaredites. This is another rendition of how they might have found the gold plates. That would be an interesting story to understand and to know where these 24 plates were hidden and how they found them. Verse 10, And behold, also they have brought breastplates, which are large, and they are of brass and of copper and are perfectly sound. And again they have brought swords. The hilts thereof have perished, and the blades thereof were cankered with rust. And there is no one in the land that is able to interpret the language or the engravings that are on the plates. Therefore I say unto thee, Canst thou translate? And I say unto thee again, Knowest thou of anyone that can translate? For I am desirous that these records should be translated into our language, for perhaps they will give us a knowledge of a remnant of the people who have been destroyed. From whence the records came, or perhaps they will give us a knowledge of this very people who have been destroyed, and I am desirous to know the cause of their destruction. I think Limhi was a great leader simply because he wanted to understand how these other people were destroyed. And so therefore, he would be able to avoid some of the same pitfalls. Verse 13, And now Ammon said unto him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man that can translate the records. 
for he has wherewith that he can look and translate all records that are of an ancient date. And it is a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters. And no man can look in them except he be commanded, lest he should look for that he ought not, and he should perish. And whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called a seer. And behold, the king of the people who are in the land of Zarahemla is the man that is commanded to do these things. And who has this high gift from God? And the king said that a seer is greater than a prophet. And Ammon said that a seer is a revelator and a prophet. And a gift which is greater can no man have, except that he should possess the power of God, which no man can. Yet a man can have great power given him from God. If these titles look familiar, it's because we just went through conference where 15 men were sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators. Verse 17, but a seer can know of things which are past and also of things which are to come. And by them shall all things be revealed, or rather shall a secret thing be made manifest, and hidden things shall come to light, and things which are not known shall be made known by them. And also things shall be made known by them, which otherwise could not be known. I did a little bit of a deep dive into the interpreters, because there are several in the history. There's the one that was originally given to the brother of Jared. Mosiah had one. Mosiah II had one. Moroni had one. And of course, Joseph Smith had one. On top of which, we have the Urim and Thummim that the high priests in Israel had. I don't know how many total there are. But there's certainly a history for it from President Packer. The scriptures speak of prophets as watchmen upon the tower who see the enemy while he is yet far off and who have beheld also things which are not visible to the natural eye. For a seer hath the Lord raised up unto his people. Many years ago, the brethren warned us of the disintegration of the family and told us to prepare. The weekly family home evening was introduced by the first presidency. Parents are provided with excellent materials for teaching their children with a promise that the faithful will be blessed. While the doctrines and revealed organization remain unchanged, all agencies of the church have been reshaped in their relationship to one another and to home. The entire curriculum of the church was overhauled based on scripture, and years were spent preparing new editions of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. We can only imagine where we would be if we were just now reacting to the terrible redefinition of the family. But that is not the case. We are not casting frantically about trying to decide what to do. We know what to do and what to teach. The course we follow is not one of our own making. The plan of salvation, the great plan of happiness, was revealed to us and the prophets and apostles continue to receive revelation as the church and its members stand in need of more. On to chapter 9. You'll note here, part of this slide is in regular print and part is in italics. The italics have been added, whereas the regular print was what comes directly from the plates. So the chapter headings are additions that have happened over time. Okay, please note at the bottom here, we're now doing a flashback because we're back to the year 200 BC. Verse 1. I, Zenob, having been taught in all the language of the Nephites, and having had a knowledge of the land of Nephi, or of the land of our fathers, first inheritance, and having been sent as a spy among the Lamanites, that I might spy out their forces, that our army might come upon them and destroy them. But when I saw that which was good among them, I was desirous that they should not be destroyed. So Zenob has a real soft spot for Lamanites, and he sees the good among them. Therefore, I contended with my brethren in the wilderness, and they have a big fight here. Most everybody is killed as father fights against father and brother against brother. Then they return to Zarahemla with about 50 people. At verse 3, And yet I, being overzealous to inherit the land of our fathers, collected as many as were desirous to go up to possess the land, and started again on our journey into the wilderness to go up to the land. But we were smitten with famine and sore afflictions, for we were slow to remember the Lord our God. He's certainly not ready to give up, so he gathers another group of people to go. Nevertheless, after many days wandering in the wilderness, we pitched our tents in the place where our brethren were slain, which was near the land of our fathers. So they're in the hills above Nephi. And Zenith goes down and makes a treaty 
with the Lamanite king to possess the land that his forefathers had. Verse 8, And we began to build buildings and to repair the walls of the city, yea, even the walls of the city of Lehi-Nephi. And we began to till the ground, yea, even with all manner of seeds, with the seeds of corn and of wheat and of barley and nays and shum, with the seeds of all manner of fruits, and we did begin to multiply and prosper in the land. Now it was the cunning and the craftiness of King Laman to bring my people into bondage, that he yielded up the land that we might possess it. Now the Lamanite king was playing the long game here, because they have peace for ten years. Verse 12. Now they were a lazy and adulterous people, therefore they were desirous to bring us into bondage, that they might glut themselves with the labors of our hands, yea, that they might feast upon the flocks of our fields. Therefore it came to pass that King Laman began to stir up his people, that they should contend with my people. Therefore there began to be wars and contentions in the land. Verse 16, And it came to pass that I did arm them with bows and with arrows and with swords and with scimitars and with clubs and with slings and with all manner of weapons which we could invent. And I and my people did go forth against the Lamanites to battle. Yea, in the strength of the Lord did we go forth to battle against the Lamanites. For I and my people did cry mightily to the Lord that he would deliver us out of the hands of our enemies. For we were awakened to a remembrance of the deliverance of our fathers. Again, a reference back to ancient Israel. 18. And God did hear our cries and did answer our prayers. We did go forth in his might. Yea, we did go forth against the Lamanites. And in one day and a night, we did slay 3,043. We did slay them even until we had driven them out of our land. And I myself, with mine own hands, did help to bury their dead. And behold, to our great sorrow and lamentation, 279 of our brethren were slain. Chapter 10. Time moves on here again, so we're 187 to 160 BC. And it came to pass that we again began to establish the kingdom, and we again began to possess the land in peace. And I caused that there should be weapons of war made of every kind, that thereby I might have weapons for my people against the time that the Lamanites should come to war against my people. Verse 6, And it came to pass that King Laman died, and his son began to reign in his stead, and he began to stir his people up in rebellion against my people. Therefore they began to prepare for war, and to come up to battle against my people. But I had sent my spies out round about the land of Shemlon, that I might discover their preparations, that I might guard against them, that they might not come upon my people and destroy them. And it came to pass that they came upon the north of the land, Shimlom, with their numerous hosts, men armed with bows and with arrows and with swords and with scimitars and stones and slings. And they had their heads shaved that they were naked and they were girded with a leathern girdle about their loins. And it came to pass that I caused that the women and children of my people should be hid in the wilderness. And I also caused that all my old men that could bear arms and also my young men that were able to bear arms, should gather themselves together to go to battle against the Lamanites. And I did place them in their ranks, every man according to his age. And it came to pass that we did go up to battle against the Lamanites. And I, even in my old age, did go up to battle against the Lamanites. And it came to pass that we did go up in the strength of the Lord to battle. And they were a wild and ferocious and a bloodthirsty people, believing in the tradition of their fathers, which is this, believing that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers, and that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren, and they were also wronged while crossing the sea. And again, they were wronged while in the land of their first inheritance after they had crossed the sea. And all this because that Nephi was more faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, he was favored of the Lord, for the Lord heard his prayers and answered them, and he took the lead of their journey in the wilderness. Notice that I've underlined wronged three times here. They really felt wronged. And the result of this idea that they were victims causes this next part. Verse 14, and his brethren were wroth with him because they understood not the dealings of the Lord. They were also wroth with him upon the waters because they had hardened their hearts against the Lord. And again, they were wroth with him. When they had arrived in the promised land, because they said that he had taken the ruling of the people out of their hands and sought to kill him. 
So this attitude of being the victim, that they were wronged, caused anger. Verse 16, and again they were wroth with him because he departed into the wilderness as the Lord had commanded him and took the records which were engraved on the plates of brass for they said he robbed them. And thus they have taught their children that they should hate them, that they should murder them, they should rob and plunder them and do all that they could to destroy them. Therefore, they have an eternal hatred towards the children of Nephi. So this attitude of being a victim that caused anger then caused them to create traditions of hatred towards the Nephites. From Elder Scott, your heavenly father assigned you to be born into a specific lineage from which you receive your inheritance of race, culture, and traditions. That lineage can provide a rich heritage and great reasons to rejoice. Yet you have the responsibility to determine if there's any part of that heritage that must be discarded because it works against the Lord's plan of happiness. You may ask, how can one determine when a tradition is in conflict with the teachings of the Lord and should be abandoned? That is not easily done. I have found how difficult it is as I work to overcome some of my incorrect traditions. Customs and traditions become an inherent part of us. They are not easy to evaluate objectively. Carefully study the scriptures and counsel of the prophets to understand how the Lord wants you to live. Then evaluate each part of your life and make any adjustments needed. Seek help from another you respect who has been able to set aside some deeply held convictions or traditions that are not in harmony with the Lord's plan. Is yours a culture where the husband exerts a domineering authoritarian role, making all of the important decisions for the family? That pattern needs to be tempered so that both husband and wife act as equal partners, making decisions in unity for themselves and their family. These are other traditions that should be set aside. Any aspect of heritage that would violate the word of wisdom that is based on forcing others to comply by the power of station, often determined by heredity, that encourages the establishment of caste systems and that breeds conflict with other cultures. Wise counsel. Verse 20, and it came to pass that we did drive them again out of our land and we slew them with a great slaughter, even so many that we did not number them. So more than 3,000. Verse 21, and it came to pass that we returned again to our own land and many people again began to tend their flocks and to till their ground. And now I being old, this is Zenob, did confer the kingdom upon one of my sons. Therefore, I say no more. May the Lord bless my people. Amen. Of course, we're going to talk about King Noah next, which is a very interesting study in this book of two different kings. One, a great king, King Benjamin, and one, not so much, King Noah. Keep reading. I look forward to talking to you next week as we delve deeper into the wonderful world of the Book of Mormon. Have a great week.